Hello, my friends. I'm so grateful to be back with you. We are at a transition point this week. If I was teaching the Book of Mormon to my BYU students, this would be the last day of the first semester. Now, you have to have a breaking point at some point between two semesters when you have a first half and a second half of a book of scripture. And in some ways, if you think about movies that you know were meant to have two parts, you have to choose the breaking point really carefully because you wanna end on something epic in movie one, but you want the sequel to start with something equally epic next time around. Well, we have that chance in the Book of Mormon. Today, we're gonna to be covering Alma 23 through 29, which is the culmination, the grand crescendo and climax of the missionary chapters. Incredible material. We'll meet the anti-Nephi-Lehi's today in chapter 24. We will see Ammon give his stirring missionary homecoming address in 26. We'll see Al uh, Alma do the same thing in chapter 29. Great way to end the semester. And then next week when we start the second half of the Book of Mormon, our second semester, we get to meet Korahor, which is the ultimate antichrist, one of the people that you just love to hate in the Book of Mormon. So as we approach the middle, the midpoint of what we're studying this year in the Book of Mormon, uh, we have some incredible things to discuss, and I'm looking forward to it. Now, if we picked up from where we left off last week, we just saw the conversion of Limhi and his queen and his people with the help of Ammon, and then go up a generation, and we have the conversion of Limhi's father uh, and many of his people with the help of Aaron. Now, it's right on the heels of that that we'll start today in chapter 23, and it's an interesting moment because one of the things they learned about from Alma, well, one of the things we learned about from Alma back in chapter 12, one of the things that these Lamanites learned from Ammon and Aaron and the others is the importance of agency. And so neither King, Lamo, neither King Lamoni nor his father are going to push conversion upon their people. It's going to be instead something where they just, well, I'll put it this way. They want to honor the agency of their people, but they want their people to honor the agency of these missionaries. And so the one thing, the one rule they make is not everyone must convert or die. No, it's everyone must allow these missionaries to share their message. Just give it a chance. If you could suspend disbelief for a moment, if you could suspend your own opposition and allow these missionaries to teach, there's actually two phrases at the beginning of chapter 23 that I love. In verse two, the missionaries were to have free access. And in verse three, the word of God was meant to have no obstruction. And I love those phrases. You think about in your own life, are we, do we have a soft enough heart? Remember, the soft heart allows for the greater portion of the word. Is our heart soft enough that we will give God's word free access? Or do we put obstacles and obstructions between our heart and God, between our ears and the mouthpieces of the Lord? What can we do to make sure that God has easy access to our mind and heart? That's all that these Lamanite kings wanted to ensure. Well, because of that, more and more the word of God spread, more and more people flooded into the, into the kingdom of God, into the church uh, of Jesus Christ. And this church was then established throughout Lamanite territory with literally thousands of people being converted. This is a good mission, okay? But notice verse six. And in Alma 23, verse six, there are, there's this verse and then there's one in Helaman 15, if I remember correctly where it gives us a chance to reverse engineer the greatest kinds of converts. Any of you who served missions, any of you parents who've tried to raise children in the faith, know the challenge of making that conversion permanent. That's something out of our control. It's so much into the hands of the person, the, the convert themselves. And there's this, always this concern of will, well, it's what Alma asked in chapter five to the people of Zarahemla. Yes, you've at some point felt to sing the song of redeeming love. Can you feel so now? Are you still as committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ as you were when you first embraced it? That's sometimes hard to come by. And yet in this verse in 23, and in this other verse in Helaman 15, it describes converts. Both, of, both groups are from the Lamanites, by the way. Uh, so conversion against the odds. But it describes these kinds of converts that never fell away. And what I love about these two passages is it shows how they got there which gives us a chance to reverse engineer the process, okay? If you understand the concept of reverse engineering, it's you have this final product that you couldn't create, but somebody else figured it out. And if you can start taking it apart and figuring it then how to put it back together, ah, now I'm starting to understand the process. Well, notice this verse in chapter 23, verse six. And as sure as the Lord liveth, 
And that's oath language. It doesn't get any stronger than that. I'm swearing on the existence of God himself. Okay, So as sure as the Lord liveth, so sure as many as believed, or, and he's going to correct himself, so he's going to explain a little bit what he means by be- believing, or as many as were brought to the knowledge of the truth. That's Mormon's definition or clarification of what belief is all about. You are brought to a place where you can actually come to know the truth, and the truth can set you free. These people are going to be permanently free from their natural men or, wom- or woman. They're permanently free from their past. And they are brought to this knowledge of the truth, notice how, through the preaching of Ammon and his brethren. What was that preaching like? Well, next phrase, according to the spirit of revelation and of prophecy. Remember, spirit of revelation is this the, the presence of the Holy Ghost working upon us, helping us see and feel the truthfulness of these things. And then the spirit of prophecy, according to the book of Revelation, is the testimony of Jesus. So they were brought through the spirit of the Holy Ghost, through the testimony of Jesus, to know that the preaching of Ammon and his brethren was true. Next step. The power of God working miracles in them. Not outside miracles, inside miracles. It's not some kind of sign-seeking, looking for things on the outside. No, I am the miracle. I am the, the, the mighty change of heart is the greatest evidence I have of God's work in my life. So God is working mighty miracles in them. Yea, I say unto you, so here Mormon's going to explain it again, reiterate, as the Lord liveth, there's our covenant language, as many of the Lamanites as believed in their preaching and were converted unto the Lord, never did fall away. It's that last phrase that I wish applied to every person I ever taught in the mission field. It's that last phrase, I pray, will apply to my children, my students, all of you. If we can have a conversion strong enough, deep enough, continuous enough that we never fall away, how do we get to that point? Well, again, look at this verse and reverse engineer the process. We ended with, they never fall away. Go back a step. And what does it say? They were converted unto the Lord. Notice that, unto the Lord. Huge, uh, really important we understand that detail. They weren't converted unto Ammon. They weren't converted unto unto Aaron. I worry sometimes that if our testimony is just based on someone else's testimony, then we are not independently connected to God. In the parable of the sower, it talks about plants that have no root in themselves and instead are tapping off of some other plant's taproot. No, we need to be converted directly unto the Lord, not even unto the church. That's still a step removed. Not even unto scripture or prophets. Again, those are steps removed. Our conversion needs to be rooted in Jesus and Jesus alone. From him, other branches can grow. We can gain testimonies of other parts of the gospel, but our conversion has to be deep and strong in him. He is the true vine. And if we are not connected to him, then living water cannot flow into us. Well, how do we get reach that kind of conversion unto the Lord? Go back another phrase. They believed in their preaching. But if you go to the earlier version, that's a little more expanded than Mormon's repetition of it, there's a preliminary step. Not just believing in their preaching, but there's that phrase I, I pointed out before. It's the power of God working miracles in them. What is it that converts me to the Lord? It's seen his hand in my life. It's seen him work miracles, this mighty change of heart. I'm not who I used to be, and I owe Jesus all the credit. If we understand that and we are rooted, grounded, established, settled in him, then we'll never fall away. But how do we get there? How do we get to the point where God is working these mighty miracles in us? Well, go back a phrase. And it's because of the preaching of the word. And that preaching must be with power. It must be with revelation. It must be with prophecy. But when we hear that word, when we come to know the word made flesh, this is Paul to the Romans. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's one of the reasons I feel so strongly about what we're doing in Come Follow Me. We are feasting upon the words of Christ. And so if we're trying to engineer, no longer reverse engineer, if we're trying to engineer lifelong disciples of Jesus Christ, then we begin with the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. It's going to help us become like God and be with God as well. So start with God's true Word. 
Allow it to bring people to the knowledge of the truth. Teach with power, with passion, with permission, with revelation, with prophecy. Allow those truths to bring them to a knowledge of Jesus Christ so he can work miracles in people's hearts. And as that begins to happen, they will be converted unto him. And since Jesus will never leave them, they'll never leave Jesus. I worry that our testimony might be in something peripheral. Our faith might might be in something, a derivative doctrine, instead of the source of all truth himself. So sink into that reality. I love that verse, okay? Ponder that. Wrestle with it as you think about sharing the gospel with other people, raising children, leading congregations, influencing other people toward that direction. Now, if you look at verse 7, notice the result of that kind of permanent conversion. It says that they became a righteous people. Notice it wasn't they became righteous people. That's individual. No, they became a righteous people, which is collective. These groups, these these villages, these families and congregations became a righteous people all together. They took care of one, one another. This is Zion beginning to sprout up in Lamanite territory. One heart, one mind, dwelling in righteousness, no poor among them. They are a righteous people. And what did they do to make sure they could perpetuate that? They did lay down the weapons of their rebellion. Now that phrase is interesting. The weapons of their rebellion. Who are they rebelling against? I would have thought to write the weapons of their warfare. And we're going to see in the next chapter that they do exactly that. But notice how it starts. Rather than some kind of physical object where I'm fighting other people and I'm going to lay down those weapons of war. No, the real... I've become an enemy to God through the natural man. And so it's my rebellion against him and these weapons of my rebellion. I've got to lay down those inward arms first. Then the outward ones can go be buried as well. But they're going to lay down the weapons of their rebellion. Notice the result, that they did not fight against God anymore. Again, that's the the primary focus. And then the secondary, neither against any of their brethren. You see the difference? They're starting to set up the cross, right? To, to bring, take up the cross daily by establishing a vertical connection with God. I'm going to stop fighting him. And as a result, I'm going to put a horizontal cross beam there and stop fighting my neighbor either. I love God. I love my neighbor. They are true Christians now. But back to this idea of weapons of war versus weapons of rebellion. They're going to bury their weapons of war so they won't fight their neighbor anymore. But it all begins by laying down their weapons of rebellion and not fighting God anymore. If you think about, actually Mormon brings this up at the end of the Book of Mormon, that he feared that the Spirit has, had ceased striving with his people. And striving, that's strife. And he's worried that God has put the dukes down. That God himself has surrendered. The Spirit is no longer working on them. And that's the point. One party or the other is going to surrender eventually. And if we don't yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, that's our surrender, then the Spirit will cease striving with us. That's God's surrender. For us to truly wave the white flag, a flag made white through the blood of the Lamb, We can accept his will in place of our own, and I I stopped rebelling against him. If you would take some time, if you need to pause this for a second, and really pray and ponder, what are the weapons of my rebellion? Don't think just about the outward acts that we do that are beneath us. Think of the inward attitudes that are leading to that. What's the rebellion inside that leads to the warfare outside? And I think if we'll ponder that, we'll realize, is pride a weapon of my rebellion? Is rationalization or justification? Is a a certain level of apathy on my part or this... You know, diabolical patience, if we want to call it that, of all procrastinating the days of my repentance. Is it just, are there things inside that we need to overcome, that we need to pray for the mighty change of heart so that our rebellion can subside? The war will then subside as a natural result. We see that in these incredible people. And boy, are those differences visible. 
If you look at verse 16 through 18, jumping ahead, it says, Now it came to pass that the king and those who were converted were desirous that they might have a name, that thereby they might be distinguished from their brethren. Now, this sounds a lot like King Benjamin's people, right? King Benjamin's hope was to create a people converted to the Lord enough that they could actually willingly take upon them his name. So here's now these Lamanite converts. What name could we possibly receive to distinguish us? Here's the answer. It came to pass that they were called that they called their names anti Nephi Lehi's, and they were called by this name and were no more called Lamanites. They began to be very industrious people, and that's a difference because often we've seen idleness and idleness coincide. Idleness, as in I D O L, also known as idolatry, leading to idleness, as in I D L E. But not these people. If idleness is idol, if idolatry is idleness, then worship is work, and they are ready to engage in that. Okay, so they're industrious. Yea, they were friendly with the Nephites. Talk about a mighty change there. Therefore, they did open a correspondence with them, and notice the final result. And the curse of God did no more follow them. Remember the difference between curse and mark. The curse is always the same. The Lamanites suffered from it. The Amlicites suffered from it. Anyone who joined those groups suffered from it because joining them meant separating themselves from God's people and most importantly, separating themselves from God. The curse is always the same and it is spiritual death. It is cutting yourself off from God and the blessings he wants to pour down upon you. And what I love about this change among these people, we're not Lamanites anymore. We've stopped, we put the dukes down. We're not fighting against God. We've laid down the weapons of our rebellion. And as a result, we don't want to be called by that anymore. I don't want to be separate from him. I want to be his people. Actually, the name anti-Nephi-Lehi is tricky because anti in our mind always means against. So it's like, wait a minute, they're going to be against Nephi and Lehi? There's been some interesting scholarship about that word, wrestling with it, with possible a Greek from the English, or is it a Reformed Egyptian? And is there something Hebraic or Egyptian about that, that anti phrase? Is it anti? Is it against? Doesn't seem like it. But is it anti as in before? That's some people's thought. Where these, we want to go back before we split off as Lamanites, before we were cursed by cutting ourselves off from God. We want to go back before when it was, when it was Lehi and Nephi. We want to stand before those people and and choose them as our spiritual forefathers, inheritors of the blessings that God has given through them. I love that they choose this name and are distinguished by it from that point on. Now, wherever there is an action, there seems to be an equal and opposite reaction. We're going to see that several times today. And when you turn to chapter 24, there's a problem because those who took the name, those who converted, have now distinguished from themselves from those who have not. And so there's unconverted Lamanites. Many of them, by and large, seem to kind of be a live and let live kind of people. But then there's these Amalekites and Amulonites. And those are, they've, they've broke, those ones have broken off from the Nephites. You have these Nephite apostates that are now living among the, the Lamanites, and they're the ones that are constantly stirring up the Lamanites to anger against their brethren. It's like, we hate our old people. Uh, we've left them and now are trying to attack them. And if we can rile up other people that would probably otherwise just be neutral, then we've got a whole army at our command that we can go fight against our former brothers and sisters. That's what's happening here. And what happens as they begin to amass their armies to try to take down the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, these converts have a choice to make. What will we do to defend ourselves? Are we going to fight back against our brethren? Well, look at verse 7 through 16. I'm not going to read them all, but that is this, that's the discourse that the new king of the, Lam- of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's gives. It's one of King Lamoni's father's sons, so it's a brother of King Lamoni. And this wonderful king is given a new name, anti-Nephi-Lehi. So we've got King anti-Nephi-Lehi over the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, and he gives this pump-up speech before battle, or in this case, before non-battle. They know what they're up against. In fact, if you read the text closely, King Anti-Nephi-Lehi would know it best of all because the Lamanite focal point is on the king. We know in in military tactics, if we can take down the leaders of of the enemy, then the enemy troops won't know what to do. And so it was specifically planned on the part of the Amalekites and Amulonites, we've got to get rid of this king. 
And so he's putting his money where his mouth is. He is not hiding at the back of the army. He's going to tell his people, this is what we're going to do. And most likely he's going to be one of the first people to pay the price for it. But here's his stirring speech, 7 through 16. Jump to verse 10. I'm going to start there. You start in verse 7. But in 10, he says, I also thank my God, yea, my great God. It's no longer a great spirit, by the way. He knows God. He's learned the, 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 the missionary messages from Ammon and Aaron. I thank my great God that he hath granted unto us that we might repent of these things. If you remember earlier chapters, we saw this prayer. I think it was on Alma's part. May God grant unto you repentance. Remember, we're not taking repentance for granted. It hasn't already been granted us as it's just for us. For the It's there for the taking, and we presume upon God's grace. No, but we are praying for it. We're asking for it. We're accepting it once it is granted. And King Antinephi Lehi understands that it's been granted. It was granted unto us that we might repent of these things. And also, he hath, he hath forgiven us of those are many sins and murders which we have committed. And it's not just that he's forgiven us. He's allowed us to feel that forgiveness because notice the next phrase. He has taken away the guilt from our hearts. And how is that even possible? Through the merits of his son. He is such a well-informed convert. He understands what the missionaries taught him. He understands what, well, he understands what Lehi taught Jacob, that it is through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah that we can be saved. He understands that perfectly. It's the grace of God, the merits of his son that allows this to happen. He probably has been taught the story of Enos, who said that his guilt was swept away because of his faith in Jesus Christ. This, th these people's guilt has been taken away from their hearts as well. Completely different. He says in verse 11, Now behold, my brethren, since it has been, notice the phrase, all that we could do, as we were the most lost of all mankind, to repent of all our sins and the many murders which we have committed, and to get God to take them away from our hearts, then he repeats himself, for it was all we could do to repent sufficiently before God that he would take away our stain. Now pause there. Do you catch the language? few words to notice. Sufficiently is an interesting one. Back in Alma 5, Alma asked, have you been sufficiently humble? Okay, not enough to be humble. You got to be humble enough. Have you reached the point in your humility that God can, ch can change you? Or in this case, have you repented sufficiently? It's one thing to ask myself, have I repented? And we could probably all say yes, but have we repented sufficiently. That adverb changes everything. And then the other part of it, and this is where you know that you truly have repented sufficiently. It was all that we could do to do that. Now, is there a verse of scripture that just popped into your head with that phrase? How about the one that says that it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do? We talked about that at length when we studied 2 Nephi chapter 25 a few months ago. When Nephi first coins that phrase and unfortunately confuses us a lot of us uh, to make us think that there's some kind of chronology that I have to do absolutely everything before grace starts to kick in. That's not the case. Go back and rewatch that, that, that episode, okay? Absolutely essential we understand it. But I love the help that King Anti-Nephi-Lehi is giving us here. That what might we mean by all that we can do? Is it achieve perfection on our own? Is it to have overcome every weakness already? Is it to have magnified our every calling to the point of pastoral perfectionism? Well, Jacob's going to push back against that, right? Or is all that we can do recognizing that there's not much we can do? I can't take the guilt out of my heart. I can't somehow overcome my many sins and murders. Think about that one. I can't reverse that. There is no way to make up for murder. We're going to see that issue coming up in a later chapter today. But I, I'm powerless. I cannot do that. I can't change. And yet what can I do? I can come to Christ motivated by my faith. That is faith unto repentance and I can repent. 
I can begin to feel some godly sorrow well up in me to the point of wanting to hand over every sin that I've been holding on to, lay down the weapons of my rebellion, put the dukes down and just say, I surrender, I submit, that I'm sorry. If we will do that, since that is all we can do, then God will forgive us our sins and remove the guilt from our hearts. Every time you hear that phrase, and as Latter-day Saints, we hear it often, it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Please notice King Anti-Nephi-Lehi waiting in the wings, raising his hand, hoping we remember what he knew he could do, which was all that he could. Now with that, Go forward and look at verse 12, because in 12 and 13 and 15 and 16, we're going to see part of what this sufficient repentance entails. I worry sometimes about what Elder Maxwell once called pre-planned prodigalism, where it's this sense of, hey, since I know I can always repent, I'm going to go do some things and go off to that far country and indulge in riotous living with the intention already in place. I know I'm going to come back. This is going and saying, hey, please put this on Jesus's tab, which unfortunately, yes, is presuming upon his grace. So notice how King Antinephi-Lehi tries to steer his people away from this. Verse 12, our swords have become bright. Then let us stain our swords no more. It's like, did you see how, how cankered and stained they were with the blood of our brethren? But God himself has washed them bright in his own blood. But now that they're bright and clean and pure, we've got to figure out how to keep them that way. Next, verse 13, for perhaps if we should stain our swords again, they can no more be washed bright through the blood of the Son of our great God. Now, that's an interesting phrase. And notice the perhaps and the if, because to be honest, that is not correct. When he says, if we did it again, maybe that's the breaking point and we can never come back from that. And yet, what did the Lord say to, in Mosiah chapter 26 to Alma the elder? As often as my people repent, I will forgive them. But it's this interesting contrary because I I know as often as I repent, he'll forgive me, but I don't want to presume upon his grace. I don't want to take that grace for granted. It hasn't been granted until I humbly ask for it, sufficiently repent of those sins. But I love the carefulness on his part. For us, instead of just presuming that, of course, my forgiveness is guaranteed, another round on the house. No, it's perhaps, and if, and I pray that forgiveness is granted me. In fact, I pray that repentance is granted me. Please, might I have another chance. With that in mind, verse 15 and 16 become absolutely incredible. Verse 15, our swords are made bright. As a result then, how are we going to keep it that way? Here's his plan. Let us hide them away that they may be kept bright as a testimony to our God that we have not stained our swords in the blood of our brethren since he imparted his word unto us and has made us clean thereby. Now notice the sense, because it's about to change in one verse. But sit with this one for a second and realize what's going on in King Anti-Nephi-Lehi's mind and heart. He's wanting it to happen among his people as well. We have been, we have used these swords. That's the first reality. The realization, I have sinned. But godly sorrow has allowed enough free-flowing tears to come to begin washing that blood off the, the sword. Christ has come and his own blood has counteracted the blood that we shed. And as a result, our swords are bright. Let's keep them that way. In fact, let's hide them away. We've already laid down the weapons of our rebellion. Now let's bury deep in the earth the weapons of our war. And that way, if we are ever called to the judgment bar, I can produce this sword as exhibit A, that I have not used it since the time that I once did or not even once, the many sins and murders which we committed. But once forgiven, we stayed clean. Here's the interesting realization, though. Does that mean those old stains are still down there somewhere underneath the surface level shine? 
is it still on the permanent record? And I can say, well, but from that moment on, I've been clean. That's what I love about verse 16. Notice what he says next. Reiterating his original plan, let's hide them. Now he gets more specific. We will bury them deep in the earth that they may be kept bright as a testimony. Now, so far, verse 16 is just like verse 15, right? But notice the, te- the actual testimony has changed. The testimony in 15, the evidence I'm giving in verse 15 is I haven't used them since, but look at the evidence in 16. It's a testimony that we have never used them at the last day. And if our brethren destroy us, behold, we will go to our God and shall be saved. I mean, there's no fear of death on his part. And like I said, he's probably the first one to go if that's the target of the enemies. But absolutely no fear. It's already been swallowed up. The sting of death is no more. O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? This incredibly converted king, in some ways it's almost, remember how every king, everybody who converts practically ends up falling in some kind of spiritual coma? It's like, oh, I already died once. It was the death of the natural man, and I was brought back to life with Abish's help, with the queen's help. I was brought, I was raised again to newness of life because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. I, I've been through death and resurrection, and so I no longer fear death. The only death that was worth fearing was spiritual death, and the curse has been taken away. So what do we have to fear from our enemies? Nothing. They might speed our return to God but they cannot interfere with it if we don't let them. So let's bury these weapons. But back to the idea of the different evidence. On the one hand, I haven't used it since my conversion, since my repentance. But a more doctrinally accurate description is the verse 16 one. I've never used them. Now, I know better than that. King Anti-Nephi-Lehi knows better than that. He's admitted to his many sins and murders. But because of the atonement of Christ, it's as if it never happened. The atonement is infinite and eternal. It doesn't just change your future. It changes your past. And it makes it rewires and rewrites that past to the point of having never committed the sin. In fact, if you want to push back against that, you're being too mortal. Let's be divine for a moment and try to see this through God's eyes. Because what does he say? If you repent of your sins sufficiently, right? If you've done all you can to repent, then I, the Lord, remember those sins no more. This is omniscience choosing amnesia. That's incredible. How can an all-knowing God forget something? Well, he chooses to. He rewrites the past as if those things never occurred. The irony is that we don't forget. We do remember. That's probably a good thing, or we'd repeat it and end up reminding ourselves. But this reality of me, think about the irony. I know some things God doesn't know, namely my repented sins. I remember things I've done, but I'm not haunted by them anymore because my guilt has been swept away. And while my guilt was swept away. God's memory of that event was swept away as well. He did the sweeping. And as he'll never remember them, Ezekiel says he'll never mention them again. It's not just that I was clean from that moment on. As far as God is concerned, you always have been clean. It never happened. Look at this sword. It's in mint condition. I pray we keep that in mind and do not underestimate the grace of God and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Chapter 24 of Alma is one of the absolute pinnacle chapters in the entire book, anywhere in scripture really, of what real repentance looks like, real preparation to avoid sin in the future looks like, real forgiveness looks like. This is true conversion and it's beautiful. Unfortunately, as I already said before, where there's an action, there's an equal opposite reaction. And there is so much pushback. This is right after the first round of of war takes place. And there have been a thousand and five casualties, 
Okay, this is what happens between uh, King Antony Philehi's speech and then the the verse I want to sh share in verse twenty three. Okay, we just had a thousand and five people slain. Now, when the Lamanites saw that their brethren, an interesting description, their brethren, these are fellow Lamanites after all. I just killed one of my own people when I saw that my brethren would not flee from the sword, neither would they turn aside to the right hand or to the left, but that they would lie down and perish. And notice this, and praised God even in the very act of perishing under the sword. That's, like I said, sting of death, we, there is none. We have absolutely no fear of it. The only thing we do fear is sin, and we're not going to commit it again, certainly not against our brethren. So it's a matter of just putting our lives on the line, to putting our trust in God, knowing he has overcome death for us. And so come what may and love it. They are praising God in the very act. But when the, when the Lamanites realize this, and they kind of come to their senses, I mean, they, they had such an appetite for blood, but once they saw the blood spilt with no defense, it woke them up to a realization of what they had just done. And look at verse 25. It came to pass that they threw down their weapons of war. They didn't just lay them down like their predecessors. No, they threw them down in this fit of godly sorrow, coming to their senses, what have I done? And they throw their weapons down. They would not take them again, for they were stung for the murders which they had committed. And they came down even as their brethren, relying upon the mercies of those whose arms were lifted to slay them. That's an incredible aftermath of a brutal battle. Brutal because it was so one-sided. But because it was so one-sided, that's what woke the enemy up, realizing, I am the enemy. And they're refusing to be the enemy as well. This is, such, again, there's something powerful about a, about a one-sided battle. Because it makes it so crystal clear that you're the one, you're the guilty party. I'm not. I have reached higher moral ground and I refuse to give up that tactical advantage. I mean, in wartime, higher ground is a tactical advantage. Well, in reality, higher moral ground, higher spiritual ground. That's the ultimate advantage. There's, if you actually want to study this at length, go to section 98 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and it's the Lord's law of war. And initially it's proclaim peace, renounce war. God's main rule of war is not to engage in it. And to think of these anti-Nephi Lehi's as the greatest example of radical pacifism that you'll find in the entire Book of Mormon to see what they are willing to go through rather than, I mean, talk about turning the other cheek. Now, we're going to see in the war chapters at the end of Alma that Captain Moroni has a different approach, okay? And they're both justified. But speaking of justification, notice this. According to section 98 of the Doctrine and Covenants, if somebody attacks me and I attack them back, then I just justify their first maneuver. It's really odd. If your kids did this and one of them hit the, the sibling and then the sibling hits them back and then they come back and they're like, oh, he started it. That's what we always say, right? He started it. Most parents say, it doesn't matter who started it. And actually our heavenly parent says the same thing. If you fight back, then their initial attack was almost a preliminary punishment for what you were going to do in return. Whoa. We totally lost the chronology there. God doesn't care about the chronology. Because your response proves to the other person that in some ways you are as willing to go to violence that as they are. Think about that. If I turn the other cheek, I am saying I refuse to accept your approach. I think there's a better one. And I'm not going to lower myself to that level. I'm going to ask you to come up to mine and invite them to join you in higher moral ground. If I succumb to the temptation to lower myself to that level, like I said, I've justified them. And it's incredible that these anti-Nephi-Lehite warriors, and I think that's a word we can use, they are not using the sword that they've buried, but they're using the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. 
They are shining as incredible examples of those who have taken upon themselves the whole armor of God. And, and more people convert that day than were killed that day. Mormon has such a fascinating attitude because he basically says, well, I guess the Lord works in mysterious ways. Uh, that, that It's amazing for me to understand just how much faith they would have had to see it in those terms, to live it out. And yet these anti-Nephi-Lehi's anti did exactly that. I refuse to respond to your anger with anger of my own because that will simply justify anger. And I won't do it. I will trust in the Prince of Peace, either bringing peace to us all or bringing us home to him. I'll take either one. Well, as a result of that, there are so many more converts, more martyrs, more converts. It's all happening. Notice, by the way, not a single Amulonite or Amalekite ends up joining the church. None of those were stung by those murders. None of, them, none of them threw their weapons down. And as a result, notice Mormons thus we see. This is verse 30. His takeaway as a historian, thus we can plainly discern that after a people have been once enlightened by the Spirit of God and have had great knowledge of things pertaining to righteousness and then have fallen away into sin and transgression, oh, what's the result there? They become more hardened. And thus their state becomes worse than though they had never known these things. This is Mormon's realization of what the Lord himself will teach in section 82 of the Doctrine and Covenants. That if you sin against the greater light, you receive the greater condemnation. And these apostates, these Amulonites and Amalekites who knew better, they've been trying so hard to push the jack-in-the-box back down and close the lid and hook the latch and refuse to allow anyone to crank the lever. No, I, I live in a different world. And it's a world that I'm justified in attacking my former brethren. This is a scary place to be. In some ways, we need to realize that, and I hope it motivates us to do all within our power to reach out to those who once knew and no longer do. There's a higher level of accountability there. And for us to try to help them hold on to faith rather than fall away from it and then fight against it, because often it leaves them in a worse place than wherever they were when they started. Emotionally, that's definitely the case. I see you as an enemy now, since I once saw you as a former friend. It's really hard to maintain neutrality after that kind of an experience. Well, in the aftermath of all of that, as you turn to chapter 25, these non-converted Lamanites, it, it, keep, it keeps spiraling. We are moving toward the extremes, and the righteous keep getting better, and the wicked keep getting worse. More and more people are joining the anti-Nephi-Lehi's. There's more and more burial plots for their weapons of war and rebellion. But as a result, those who refuse to lay down those weapons are all the more anxious to brandish them against their brethren. What ends up happening in chapter 25 is fascinating because the, they decide rather than just attack anti-Nephi-Lehi's, let's go to the source and let's attack the Nephites themselves. It's been basically a period of peace between Nephites and Lamanites, and then kind of out of the blue, they're so angry by the conversion of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's that they march straight into Nephite territory and have enough time to conquer one city. They annihilate the place. And then they're driven back, and they leave, and there's more peace between Nephites and Lamanites after that for a little while. And guess what the one city is that they level? It's Ammonihah. Exactly as, as Alma had warned them when he went on his mission among them with Amulek. God can destroy this place in one day. And they're like, yeah, right. That's impossible. Well, not only is it possible, it happened in chapter 25. It's interesting because here you almost see these two stories woven together in one. Where the people who wouldn't listen to Alma, I'll put it this way. The people who wouldn't listen to Ammon and his brethren take out the people who wouldn't listen to Alma and Amulek. I mean, the scriptures say that it is by the wicked that the wicked are destroyed, and that's exactly what happened here. The non-converts of Ammon are taking down the non-converts of Alma. 
And then just wait because then there's this incredible reversal because the converts of Alma will later take care of the converts of Ammon. Uh, again, they're separate missions. The sons of Mosiah among the Lamanites, Alma among the Nephites. But those stories converge in some really beautiful ways before the two parties meet up again at the end of their 14-year absence. Really, really cool. But notice also what happens here. Uh, in chapter 25, I just want to show you uh, one verse that I think is worth, or two verses that I think are worth really noticing. Because when people came into the church, remember some are fighting against it with more and more intensity. More and more people are flooding into it. How do they live the gospel? What does that look like? And the irony here is it's BC, and so they're still called to live the law of Moses, but they have an eye of faith toward the coming of Christ. So these are Christian Jews, if we want to call it that way. Okay, These are Old Testament ordinances with New Testament faith. And what a combination. Talk about proving the contraries of faith and works. Okay, Notice how it, it plays out in verse 15 and 16 of chapter 25. Yea, they did keep the law of Moses. And here, every time the text says law of Moses, for our sake, we can replace it with something like works or magnifying your calling or keeping the commandments or just do, do, do all the stuff that God is asking of us, right? Now we do that. We keep the law of Moses. We perform these works. We, we magnify our calling. We keep the commandments. But here's why. It was expedient that they should keep the law of Moses as yet. It's like right now, God wants us to be doing certain things. Fine, we'll do them. It was not all fulfilled, the text says, but notwithstanding the law of Moses. So notwithstanding our ordinances, our works, our activity, all the things that we're doing, despite that, notwithstanding that, they did look forward to the coming of Christ. Considering that the law of Moses, or our works, our actions, our callings, all those things, considering that that was a type of his coming, and believing that they must keep those outward performances until the time that he should be revealed unto them. Now, they did not suppose that salvation came by the law of Moses. That is hugely important. That's not what sal that's not what's saving me, okay? It's something I'm doing because it's something God asks of me, but that's not where salvation comes from. What is it? What's the point of all these works then? Well, here's the answer. The law of Moses did serve to strengthen their faith in Christ. And thus they did retain a hope through faith unto eternal salvation, relying upon the spirit of prophecy, which spake of those things to come. I love that verse. That is such a beautiful echo and expansion of what we saw back in 2 Nephi 25. Right after it is by grace that ye are saved, after all that we can do. Again, thank you, King Anti-Nephi-Lehi, for helping me understand that. And then go forward. And what's Nephi say next in 2 Nephi 25? that we keep the law of Moses, but we teach our children the deadness of the law, even while they live it, so that they know that their life is in Christ, not in these things. This is the wax on, wax off, karate kid analogy we talked about, okay? This is, these works are works of reconciliation, not works of salvation. They're meant to retrain my will so that I have righteous reflexes. They don't save me. I don't pull myself up by my bootstraps. I love this explanation because if I have faith in Christ, that's how I retain this hope that Christ can save me. This is all text right from those verses, okay? Faith leading to that kind of hope. But what is it, what is it that instills that faith in me and extends that hope in him? It's that I'm doing the things that he is asking of me. I'm retraining my righteous reflexes. I'm reconciling my will to God. I hope that we can add this verse, those verses, 15 and 16 of Alma 25, to what we see in 2 Nephi 25, to be able to recognize why we do what we do in the gospel. The next time uh, one of our wonderful born-again Christian friends asks us why you're so busy, why you Latter-day Saints think you have to earn salvation, oh, I can understand why you might mistake that based on what you see. I am waxing on, waxing off constantly. But why? Because it strengthens my faith in Christ. I'm not earning a thing, but I'm learning so much. And Christ is my teacher. You with me? If you understand that, we are now ready for a missionary homecoming. 
in some ways, the mission is coming to a close. These 14 years are nearing their end. And here in chapter 26, we get a chance to hear Ammon give what we might consider a missionary homecoming address. My own pales in comparison to what Ammon's going to give us here. Many of you return missionaries, I'm sure, actually chose a verse from Alma 26 to put on your missionary plaque. Well, Ammon's missionary plaques better be huge because it's going to need the entire chapter, okay? Notice, for example, verse 2, what he, what he says and what he asks. He says, now I ask, what great blessings has he bestowed upon us? Here's Ammon reflecting upon his mission. He's talking it over with his brothers, and, he, and they're rejoicing together. They, they got to be a part of something incredible. But he asks, what great blessings has he bestowed upon us? Can ye tell? And I don't want to leave that as some kind of rhetorical question. Like, man, we've been through some amazing things, and God really blessed us, didn't he? No. Stop. Think back to your mission. Think back to your the, the callings that you've magnified and the ways you've been a part of other people's lives. And honestly ask yourself that question. Can ye tell? Think about it. Begin to brainstorm. Begin to remember. Begin to record the blessings that flowed into your life when you were an instrument in the hands of God. I think it will change your perspective on your service. And instead of thinking like God owes you a debt of gratitude, oh no, reverse the roles. You owe God a great debt of thanks that he would let you come and serve. This is Christ to John the Baptist. Thus it becometh us, you and me, to fulfill all righteousness. Elder Halverson, come with me to Puerto Rico. We'll do some amazing things. I'll let you help me. And can I tell the blessings that have come through my missionary service? Can I tell the blessings that have come in serving and callings the Lord has given me? Can I tell the blessings that have flowed into my life through the endowment of power that came through the temple? Can I inventory the Malachi measure as God has opened the windows of heaven and poured out so many blessings that I can't receive them, I can't enumerate them, I can't tell them all. But let me try. Let me count my many blessings one by precious one. And I'll be amazed at what the Lord has done, including what he's done with me and through me as he's blessed his children. The, you want to prepare yourself for an amazing trip down memory lane, then answer Ammon's question. Can you tell? In verse 12, here's a verse that we often quote because what Ammon's been doing to the, the last 10 verses or so is just exulting in the blessings of God. He's telling those blessings. He's stoked about them to the point that his brother Aaron starts to wonder, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm worried that you're, you're starting to spin down the pride cycle, little brother. Uh, I'm worried that your, your boasting is, is bringing, calling too much attention to yourself. And I love Ammon's humble pushback to say, brother, are you kidding me? This isn't pride. This is praise. It's not what we did. It's what God did. But the fact he let us join him, I'm, be, I'm beside myself. He says in verse 12, yea, I know I am nothing. There's no pride there. I've got nothing to be proud of. You remember what we were like before our conversion, before the angel stopped us in our tracks? Oh, I'm nothing. As to my strength, I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself. But, oh, you better believe it. I will boast of my God. For in his strength, I can do all things. Yea, behold, many mighty miracles we have wrought in this land, for which we will praise his name forever. This has never been about me. This has always been about God. And if we can somehow deflect the glory back to its source and back to its target, it all emanated from him. It should all return to him. What a blessing we just got to be. We were caught in the crossfire <laughs> or the cross blessings, if we want to call it that, that he was able to use us in some small way. Oh, glorying. This is the Book of Mormon's equivalent of Paul glorying after a similarly glorious mission. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
Well, Ammon continues to glory, okay? Uh, his praise is in crescendo. And he finally says in verse 16, therefore let us glory. Yea, we will glory in the Lord. Yea, we will rejoice. Our joy is full. Yea, we will praise our God forever. Behold, who can glory too much in the Lord? Yea, who can say too much of his great power and of his mercy and of his long suffering toward the children of men? How's that for sufficient? There's no sufficiency of praise. I could do this all day. In fact, I can't do enough of it. The way Ammon says it at the end, Behold, I say unto you, I cannot say the smallest part which I feel. And that inability to say it actually speaks volumes. As exultant as this praise was, to the point of starting to look like pride, it's still the tip of the iceberg. It's a tiny glimpse of what lies beneath. I remember it hitting me once that real worship is not something we do. At least not do alone. Real worship is something we do because of something we feel about something we believe. And if the belief isn't there, certainly the feeling won't be there. And if the feeling is there is not there, then the action will be pretty hollow. And I worry sometimes about our hollow worship, which can't be called worship at all. This shallow praise, which isn't very praiseworthy because we're not really praising much at all. And yet, if we believe these things, if we've experienced these things, if we've felt the mighty change of heart, then how can I keep from singing? I can't say the least part of what I feel, but what I feel, it's going to come out somehow. One of my favorite contraries about worship is what Jesus said to the woman at the well. When he said to her that the Father seeks worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. When I go and worship with my born-again Christian friends, I know that there are, at least from my perspective, there are some truths that they might be missing. But oh, do they make up for it, and then some, in the spirit with which they praise. When they've come with me to my church, and I've had conversations with evangelical groups that have come to Utah, and we've done interfaith dialogues together, and sometimes they've gone to a Latter-day Saint worship service, a sacrament meeting, and sometimes they come away worried that, yes, you guys may claim all kinds of truth, but sometimes I worry that your worship is devoid of spirit. Now, I'll admit, sometimes there can be a, a tendency to equate spirituality or spiritual so spirituality with emotionalism. And the mighty change of heart is not the same thing as an adrenaline rush. I want to clarify that. You're, we, we don't have to praise in the same way as other people, but we better be praising and it better be heartfelt. If we can't say the least part of what we feel, it better not be because we're not feeling anything. If we truly believe and allow that to inspire emotion and allow emotion, spirit, to inspire action, then our worship will be in spirit and in truth, and those need not be mutually exclusive. I love Ammon for this. Put this one on your missionary plaque, would you? Well, the question is, do we feel that way? And how often do we feel that way? Uh, is there a way to begin feeling that way if we don't? He actually gives us some clues on that one too. Here's a verse about the reason and here's a verse about the why, or the way, I should say. Look at verse 21. Now behold, my brethren, what natural man is there that knoweth these things? And he answers his own rhetorical question. I say unto you, there is none that knoweth these things, save it be the penitent. This is actually going to get confirmed a few chapters later when he reunites with Alma in actually the very next chapter, chapter 27, verse 18. As they kind of collapse into each other's arms, so stoked to see that they're still brethren in the Lord. 27, 18, behold, this is joy which none receiveth, save it be the truly penitent and humble seeker of happiness. I love that. Put those two verses together. And how do I feel those things? How often do I? Well, am I penitent? Am I humble? 
Am I seeking that kind of happiness and living the life that would open myself to it? What did Abraham say? Knowing there was greater happiness and peace and rest for me, I sought the source of that, and I found it in the blessings of the fathers. And I love the thought of a level of happiness. This is not mere pleasure. This is not just adrenaline. This isn't just excitement. This isn't just a good day. This is a depth, a steadiness that is immune to outside circumstances. No wonder I never fall away if I can maintain that penitence, that gratitude, that willingness to come unto Christ. Then, of course, my as a seeker of happiness, I will find it in the most profound of ways. Now, the other verse I wanted to share, though, is verse 22, right on the heels of the one we just read. If 21 is the reason, we may or may not be feeling this way. 22 is a way we can come to feel that way much more often. I love this verse. He says, Yea, he that repenteth, so we're going to kind of put this in order. We've got some engineering to do here. He that repenteth, so here I am trying to align my will with God's. Next step, and exerciseth faith. So now I'm trusting in God. I'm tapping into his divine power. Faith and repentance are coming hand in hand. Faith unto repentance, like Amulek would say. Repenting to exhibit my faith, to exercise my faith. Next two steps, bringing forth good works. So I'm doing my part. And praying continually without ceasing. So I'm asking God to do his part. We, we together on this one so far? I'm, I'm seeking the Spirit's guidance in my life by repenting. I'm exercising my faith. I'm working as hard as I can, though I know that I'm not earning a thing, okay? But I'm laboring. I'm praying continually, knowing that God has to be part of this companionship too. But as that happens, notice the result. Keep reading the verse. Unto such it is given to know the mysteries of God. Yea, unto such it is given to reveal things which never have been revealed. Yea, it shall be given unto such to bring thousands of souls to repentance even as it has been given unto us to bring these, our brethren, to repentance. I love that verse. Notice the phrase given, it shall be given, comes up three different times. And this repetition of it's given reminds us it's a gift. It's not us. I'm not glorying in myself. Okay, this is praise, not pride. And so what is being given me as I qualify for these blessings? God knows what I'm going to do with it. Because I've purified my motives, I'm repenting. I'm exercising faith in him, so I've got the, the right reasons there. I'm engaged in work, but it's not works righteousness. It's works of righteousness with right purpose in mind, okay? I've, I've purified all those motives. I'm praying continually for help. The Lord's like, whoa, turn on the hose full speed. I mean, you've unkinked this thing. It's ready to come. The water's ready to come to the end of the rope. So yeah, I'm going to crank out as many blessings as I can. I'm going to pour living water into you and through you to others. It will be given you these three things. Look back at them. It will be given to know. It will be given to reveal. And it will be given to bring people to the source of those, of those gifts. I love the thought of a vertical connection first. I'm, it's given me to know. Here's this conduit of revelation. It's open and God is pouring down truth upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. What do I do with it next? I take the vertical flow and turn it horizontal so that it is given to reveal. I don't think he gave it to me just for my sake. He taught me knowing I would teach other people. I've unkinked the hose, okay? And so it's given unto me to know. Now it's given unto me to reveal. I'm teaching people things that they've never heard before because I'd never heard it before. Honestly, this happens to me all the time, even doing this. And I'll video edit or I'll watch the, the, the final product and it's like, wow, I think that's true. I never thought of that. And it's like, it's you talking. What do you mean you never thought of that? It's like, well, it wasn't in my notes. It wasn't in my preparation. It wasn't in my head. But it was given unto me to know in the very moment that it was given unto me to reveal. And to be able to teach things that you didn't know and teach things that I didn't know, it's nothing to do with me. This is not pride. It is praise. And it's amazing where that revelation's coming from. When you're engaged in that process, 
the vertical, the horizontal. You're, it's, we're all coming together. No wonder you are able to, you, it is given unto you to bring souls unto that kind of conversion. You tap them back into the vertical that it all started with you. And now that they have been converted, now that they're connected vertically to, they can continue the same process. They can repent of their sins. They can exercise faith. They can work. They can pray. And it will be given to them, just like it was given to you, to know and to reveal and to bring. And another cycle continues. The ripples continue to expand and extend. And God makes sure the living water gets everywhere it needs to go. I love this. Ammon, thank you for your mission. I wish we had more of it. It's tragic that out of 14 years worth, we basically got one transfer. <laughs> we got one golden investigator. The rest, well, I guess we'll have to wait and ask him for another missionary homecoming address in the next life. So beautiful. Well, a few other things I want to hit before we call it, a, call it a week. Chapter 27 is the aftermath of this. And the Amalekites and the Lamanites are still as angry as ever. The anti-Nephi-Lehi still refuse to fight. We're not going to change. In chapter 27, verse 3, now this people again refuse to take their arms, and they suffer themselves to be slain according to the desires of their enemies. That again, by the way, is mind-blowing. It's one thing to be the first round of anti-Nephi-Lehi's. Kneeling, arms stretched to heaven, asking for God's strength, not the mercy of their enemies. No sword in hand, but the sword of the Spirit. And they were mowed down with no resistance. Now, I would imagine that many of them, I know this would be me if I was an anti-Nephi-Lehi. I have faith in Christ. I don't fear death, at least mm, not as much as I normally would, but I sure would prefer to live. And since I believe so strongly in the power of God unto salvation, I believe also he can save me here and now, that he can soften their hearts. I'm not going to fight them, but God can. God can preserve me. He can deliver me. And so to picture the first time as the, the Lamanite army is rushing across the battlefield and you're like, okay, uh, anytime now, God, you can preserve me, you can protect me, you can save me, spare me. And then it doesn't happen. And you get those thousand casualties. Well, what about this, the next round? When the Lamanite armies again muster and start rushing across the battlefield, and I'm looking, I have no evidence that God spares us physically. I have utmost faith he spares, spares us spiritually. And spiritual death is the only death I really fear. But still, I don't think we're going to survive this. This is like Abraham after the daughters of Oneida in Abraham chapter 1. These three incredible sister saints refused to give up their virtue and, and faith, and they were slaughtered. They were sacrificed to these pagan gods. And then Abraham's next on the, in the lineup. And as he's being laid down on this lion couch and the wicked priests are raising the knife, what do you think Abraham's thinking? God's going to save me? Why would that even cross my mind? He didn't save them. If we've got those two options from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? If it be so, God can save me. But if not, I still trust him. Well, Abraham may have hoped for the, but if not, but he just saw the daughters of Oneida get the, if it be so. And he probably assumed, I'm next. Again, what a miracle for him that he got the other phrase. It was a, but if not for, uh, it was an, if it be so for him. They, sorry, the daughters of Oneida got the, but if not. He got the, if it be so, but he would have expected the, but if not. He would have expected not to be delivered physically. And the same would have been true for this second round of casualties. And yet they exhibited the same kind of faith as the first group. In fact, maybe even more faith because of what they'd seen before. But how does that work upon the heart of the missionaries that 
that were instrumental in this conversion. It's hard enough to see people you love go through hard things. But to go through something like this, my, my conversion that led to their conversion has now led to their massacre. And I can't handle this. Chapter 27 is such a masterful description of missionaries and their absolute love for the people that they've taught. And they're like, we cannot handle this. We cannot allow this to happen. So they say, hey, you come with us. We got some pretty good connections back in Zarahemla. The king's our dad, okay? Uh, and though we're not going to succeed him in the throne, we've changed some things. There's still power in my father's part. And if we can just introduce you to him, he'll solve the problem. He'll protect you. Well, notice chapter 27, verse 8, and the response of the anti nephi Lehi's. They say, if the Lord saith unto us, go, we will go down unto our brethren. Fine, we'll do it. But here's, the, here's what we plan on. We will be their slaves until we repair unto them the many murders and sins which we have committed against them. It's the only thing they can think of. There's no way the Nephites are going to let us move into Nephite territory. After all that we've done to them, I am grateful that God forgave us and swept away our sins. I'm grateful that God doesn't think we've ever used those swords, but the Nephites probably remember every single casualty. There's no way they're going to forgive us. There's no way they're going to accept us into their society. But as Ammon and his brothers keep reassuring them, no, no, it's different. It's a different thing. Believe us, trust us, come home with us. I can't stand to see you perish because of what we've taught you. This is like Alma and Amulek all over again, seeing their converts burned in the fires and just wanting to do something to help them. The four sons of Mosiah are a lot more like Amulek in that one. We can't stand idly by and just let it happen. You've got to come with us. But notice what the anti nephi Lehi said. Two things I really want to stand out for us. Number one, our hope is that we can repair the many murders that we've committed against them. But do you see the problem with that? I already said this before. How do you repair murder? Restitution should be a part of our repentance. If I stole something, I'll pay it back. I'll try to fix what I broke. But life, death, that's out of my control. That's why murder is such a significant sin. There's nothing I can do to repair it. So first thing I would say to the anti nephi Lehi's, that's not an option. You can't repair it, no matter what you do. The other one is even more interesting to me. When, they, when the anti nephi Lehi say, we will be their slaves until we repair these things, two problems, two pushbacks. Number one, you can't fix it. You can't repair it. But number two, we're not asking you to. Repent, restitution in this case is impossible, but it's also going to be unnecessary as far as the way you're describing it. Because if you think restitution requires slavery, that's against the law of our father. I, I, th that's how Ammon responds to this. Like, that's not going to, that's not going to cut it. There's, there's no slavery back home in Zarahemla. So try as you might. You can't pay us back, first of all, but we're not even going to let you try because slavery is against the law. To me, there's something powerful about realizing, and this, I hope, is another cure for our tendency towards work, works righteousness, thinking that I have to do all these things before grace kicks in. No, if I understand, first of all, I can't make up for my sins. I can't undo what I've done. Only Christ can do that and make my swords permanently bright. But Christ is not asking for my slavery. He's not trying to enslave me. That's not why I'm working. I'm not working off my debt. Remember the two ledgers we learned about with King Benjamin's help. Yes, the Lord wants, the Lord wants us to do things, but not to credit our account. No, just to keep reconciling our will. I love the realization that God the law of our Father forbids that kind of slavery. I think it was John Taylor who once said, I will not be God's slave, but I will be his servant. There's a difference there. There's an offering of agency there. There's a willingness to submit our will to the will of the Father. 
And that's what these anti Nephi Lehi's have done already. But I love the clarification they get from these Nephite princes saying that's not the way our kingdom works. You understand? So powerful. Well, they finally get the Lord's permission. That's what they asked. Like, well, you, I don't, I don't know if they're going to accept us, but if God gives the green light, I guess we'll go. They get the green light. They, get, they head back home. But what I love what happens, I'll just sum this up quickly. Uh, the, they get to the outskirts of town, basically. And then Ammon and his brothers are like, okay, why don't you wait here for a second? We'll go in and make sure it's okay with my dad and the people. And you picture like, wait, wait, wait. Huh? We followed you all the way and you still haven't gotten horizontal per permission? You got the vertical one. That's great. But huh, what are they going to say? This is like, hey, dad, uh, the dog followed me home. Can we keep him? This is, hey, these converts that came from, from my mission, they came out to visit. Can they stay? And we're talking multitudes, whole communities, congregations, thousands of converts. And now I'm knocking on the door saying, Dad, can they stay for a while? Wow, that's a scary moment. Well, the brothers go in. The father says, well, I'm a king, but we're switching to judges, and I, under, I, I trust the will of the people. Let's ask them. It's like, gulp, uh-oh. God would be, it gives a green light. The king would give a green light. But would regular people that have been had family members massacred by Lamanites before, will they be that forgiving? What a, it's, it speaks volumes of the Nephites that they were worthy of God's confidence and the king's confidence because they all said, of course they can stay. In fact, we will clear out the land of Jershon Give them lands for their inheritance. That's big in the Old Testament age. We'll give them this territory. We'll cede it to them for our, ourselves. And then interesting detail that comes up in chapter 27. It's they said, we will set, then we'll set our armies between the land of Jershon and the land of Nephi. Now I've played with this with my own students because I try to draw it on the board and just, okay, so land of Nephi and then the land of Jershon and then land of Lamanites right over there. And they're going to put our, wh where are we going to put our armies? Between the land of Nephi and the land of Jershon? Wait a minute. What does that say? Can you picture Nephites living in the land of Nephi and then former Lamanites, new converts, anti-Nephi Lehi's living in the land of Jershon and like, just to be on the safe side, let's put our army between us because we don't really trust you. Well, if that's the case, you don't know your Nephite Lamanite geography. The land of Nephi is not where the Nephites live anymore. They left that centuries before, at least generations before. I've got to check my math on that. But ge geographically, it's the Lamanites that live in the land of Nephi. That's what makes this verse so cool when you look at verse 23. We will set our armies between the land Jershon where our new convert brothers and sisters live, and the land Nephi, which is where the Lamanites live, the old enemies live. We're going to protect them, in other words. And in fact, by putting the army there between new convert and old enemy, we have left no army between new convert and lifelong member. There's no boundary. We completely trust your conversion. It's so beautiful. It says, we'll do that so that we may protect our brethren, they're calling them that already, in the land Jershon. And this we do for our brethren on account of their fear, not of the enemy, but their fear to take up arms against their brethren, lest they should commit sin. And this, their great fear, came because of their sore repentance, which they had, on account of their many murders, their awful wickedness. Notice they don't sugarcoat the, the anti-Nephi-Lehi's former sins at all. They know exactly what they've done and done to them, but they're moving past it. We trust your mighty change of heart. We will protect you from your enemies. We feel no need to protect ourselves from you. This to me is one of the most beautiful examples of Zion you could ask for. And yet it's about to be tested intensely. Now they know what they're up against. There's been battles left and right. Ammonihah just got destroyed, right? A Nephite city, a wicked one at that, but it's still a dis leveled in one day because of angry ne Lamanites that were mad about the conversion of some of their own people. So, okay, we're probably up for a fight. 
protecting these people will come at personal cost. But since we're willing to make that, that cost for you, is there something you're willing to make a, a sacrifice for us? It's actually really fascinating how this works. This is in verse 24. They ask for a portion of their substance to assist us that we may maintain our armies. And that seems pretty straightforward, pretty simple. In some ways, what a blessing for the anti-Nephi Lehi's. You do have something to contribute. You're not going to give your arms because you don't, you don't have any weapons anymore. You buried them. But provisions for our armies, that is a way you could contribute. I love that this is not some kind of patronizing paternalism. Like, oh, new convert, you got nothing to give. Uh, you're only here to take. And so, yeah, I guess in our magnanimity, we will give it to you. But no, that's paternalism. I love that the Nephites see in their anti-Nephi-Lehite brethren equal partners in the work of the Lord. There are some things you simply cannot and will not and should not do. I I'm actually agree with you on that. You be the radical pacifists, we will defend the families of faith. But will you contribute what you can? We'll give something to you, you'll give something to us, and that way we are equal partners in this work, even though we're going about it in different ways. I think that's absolutely essential to understand. You're no more strangers. You're no more foreigners. You're not just adopted people that we're trying to take care of because you're little and can't do anything for yourself. No, you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Thank you, Paul, to the Ephesians. Okay. Well, with that, look at verse 27 and 28, and we'll finish this chapter. They were among the people of Nephi and also numbered among the people who were of the church of God. It's like, you're one of us now. And they were also distinguished. Now pause there, because what I love about this is there's probably all kinds of ways you could distinguish an anti-Nephi Lehite, right? And sadly, the way we typically judge people by their outward appearance, what would the distinguishing feature be? Uh, there's no more curse, but is there still a mark? Do we look differently on the outside if that's the way we interpret that mark? Well, notice the way they were truly distinguished. It wasn't by their heritage. It wasn't skin color. It wasn't anything less than this. They were distinguished for their zeal towards God and also towards men. <laughs> what, how did they stand out? Not because they looked differently, because they were they seemed to be more righteous, more loving, more converted than the lifelong members. They kept the first great commandment. They kept the second great commandment. They loved God, loved men, and that blew everyone away. Like, how do you spot an anti-Nephi Lehi? Oh, they're just awesome. They're so loving. Wait, aren't they? Don't they look a little bit? Oh, I, I, I guess, now that you mention it. Hadn't noticed. They're just incredible converts. I wish. I wish I were more like them instead of them becoming more like me. I've got some converting to do myself. Keep reading. Notice what else it says about them. They're distinguishing features. They were perfectly honest and upright in all things. They were firm in the faith of Christ, even unto the end. And they never did look upon death with any degree of terror for their hope and views of Christ and the resurrection. Therefore, death was swallowed up to them by the victory of Christ over it. Oh, we've seen that before. Nothing to fear. Whether the first round, the second round, any rounds that follow, death holds no terror. How could it? Well, as I said, their unity as Zion, brothers and sisters, is about to be tested to the extreme. The same Lamanites stirred up by Amulonites and Amalekites are so livid about this that they come rushing in to try to take down the anti-Nephi Lehi's. But what's standing in their way? The Nephite army, ready to defend their new brethren. And it comes at intense personal cost. They succeed in protecting the anti-Nephi Lehi's. But it was a battle. This is Mormon describing it. And Mormon, who knows all of Nephite history up to that point, and up to his point, obviously, he says this is the worst battle that there's ever been in Lamanite-Nephite warfare to that point. He's going to, Mormon himself is going to live through some worse ones by the end, right? When it truly is the end. But up to this point, hundreds of years of wars and contentions, and nothing's ever been this bad. 
He uses the phrase in verse 3 of chapter 28, there was a tremendous slaughter among the people of Nephi. Those were the good guys, protecting their new brothers and sisters in the faith. And I want you to imagine if it were you, I'm, I'm a fixer, which unfortunately sometimes makes me a blamer. When I'm looking around for things to fix, I'm trying to also figure out what's the problem that caused it. And sometimes in a worst case scenario, it can lead to whose fault is this? Well, if I was in one of those bad moments and I was picturing the slaughter, the tremendous slaughter that the Nephite army just experienced, why did this happen? Why did the Lamanites attack us? And there is a glaring reason. And I can only imagine if it would have crossed some Nephite minds of widows or children who no longer have a father coming home from the war. This wouldn't have happened if you hadn't come. This is on you. Yeah, I'm grateful you joined the church, but couldn't you have done it from a distance? I'm glad you don't fear death, but I just experienced it in my own family. And it wouldn't have been this way. We've had peace. I mean, the, the, yeah, Em and I got level, but that was your fault too. I mean, this is hard. This is putting to the test how much you trust someone else's conversion, how much you trust your own acceptance of them. I mean, notice the verse in, or notice the description in verse four through six. This was a time that there was a great mourning and lamentation heard throughout all the land among all the people of Nephi. How could it not be? Yea, the cry of widows mourning for their husbands, of fathers mourning for their sons, the daughter for the brother, the brother for the father. The cry of mourning was heard among all of them, mourning for their kindred who had been slain. How many times do you have to say mourning in like two verses? But it's this weeping, this wailing, this devastation. It says, now surely this was a sorrowful day. And there's the understatement of the Book of Mormon. Yea, a time of solemnity. And then notice this, back to a church setting. A time of much fasting and prayer. And it makes me wonder, what are they fasting for? What are they praying about? Can you imagine the first, oh, state conference after this slaughter? As the Jershon First Ward and the Zarahemla First Ward come together and I'd be fasting for forgiveness. I'd be praying for spiritual strength. I cannot blame them. This is not their fault. This is God working in mysterious ways, but I'm having a harder time swallowing it. There's plenty of widows and orphans on their side too. From round two, what could have been round, or from round one, what could have been round two, this is mourning all around, but the solemnity, the sorrow, the fasting, the, the prayer, where you picture some widow saying to a new family of Ammonite converts, I'm grateful you're here. Welcome to church. I'm sorry for all you've been through. And I know you're sorry for all I'm going through too. This is a fellowship of suffering, as Paul would call it. But it's a fellowship nonetheless. And when your acceptance of others is put to the test, when your forgiveness, when your inclusivity when it's in your own backyard, I pray we can be as Christ-like as we claimed to be before all of that was tested. Now, by the time all of that is, is over, the missions are over. Notice how they are summed up in chapter 28, verse 8. This is the account of Ammon and his brethren. Their journeyings in the land of Nephi, we saw some of that. Their sufferings in the land, yep, we read about that. And But then notice this, this description. Their sorrows and their afflictions and their incomprehensible joy. 
the reception and safety of the brethren in the land of Jershon. And now may the Lord, the Redeemer of all men, bless their souls forever. If that's not a perfect summary of a mission or a chance to serve others, I don't know what it is. Sorrow, affliction, incomprehensible joy. I felt all of those in Puerto Rico. I felt all of them since. As a parent, as a priesthood leader, as a teacher of the gospel, as a friend to people, you can't get to the incomprehensible joy until you have endured often equally incomprehensible sorrow. Mormon then ends this chapter, and in a way ends his take on the missionary chapters. He'll let Alma get the final word in just a moment, but he ends with several morals of the story, including this one in verse 14. Now we see the great call of diligence of men to labor in the vineyards of the Lord. And thus we see the great reason of sorrow and also of rejoicing. There it is again, that balance. Sorrow because of death and destruction among men and joy because of the light of Christ unto life. There we are in the valley of decision as usual. But speaking of the great call of diligence that was heeded by Ammon and Aaron and Omner and Himni, it was also heeded by Alma. They had a foreign mission. He served statesides, uh, stateside. Okay? Uh, he, he was close to home, at home trying to whip his fellow Nephites into shape while his brethren, his old partners in crime and now partners in conversion, were blessing the Lamanites. And so we turn to Alma for this final chapter today. I'll just share a few verses uh, because he was one who also heard the call of diligence and decided to make a difference right there at home. The way he begins his missionary homecoming address is the stuff worthy of psalms, worthy of songs, worthy of music. This first one has actually been put to music. And it says, Oh, that I were an angel and could have the wish of mine heart that I might go forth and speak with a trump of God, with a voice to shake the earth and cry repentance unto every people. Yea, I would declare unto every soul as with a voice of thunder, repentance and the plan of redemption. And why would that be my message? That they should repent and come unto our God, that there might not be more sorrow upon all the face of the earth. There's the sorrow and affliction that we just read about. And Alma has experienced an infinity of it packed into 14 years. What he saw among his converts in Ammonihah, there's inexpressible agony as they were consumed in a lake of fire and, of, and brimstone, set ablaze by people that wouldn't listen to his call to repent. No wonder I want to be an angel so I could have been better at this than I was. Is there some regret in this? Is there some hope in this? Is there joy? Is there pain? It's all there. We see the pathos of the Psalm of Nephi in 2 Nephi 4. Well, here's the pathos of Alma in a similar Psalm in Alma chapter 29. All that he's been through, I, I wish I could have been better. I wish I had a voice like a trumpet. I wish I could shake the earth because there's too much pain. There's too much pain on the part of those who, who are attacked by others, too much pain on those who have to watch it happen in front of their eyes. It's pain everywhere. And the only cure for pain I know is repentance. The pain comes from sin. The sorrow comes from sin. To overcome it through the grace of Christ, that's the only solution I know of. It's what saved me. It's what saved my brothers, my brethren. It's what saved every person that I've met that's accepted it. So turn me into an angel, Father. In fact, turn me into the one that saved me. Do you remember the experience? Put stopped in his tracks by this angel from heaven that spoke with a voice of a trumpet that shook the earth, that cried repentance. What's Alma asking for? I want to be for others what that angel was for me. There's something powerful about that. May I be the effect in other people's lives that God has had in my own. 
Alma wants that more than anything. It's what Ammon wanted. It's what Aaron wanted. It's what they got to be for a time. They even said that. Our converts looked at us as if we were angels. Indeed, we were. He says in verse 10, along those same lines, Behold, when I see many of my brethren truly penitent and coming to the Lord their God, then is my soul filled with joy. Then do I remember what the Lord has done for me. Yea, even that he hath heard my prayer. Yea, then I do remember his merciful arm which he extended towards me. It goes back to what we just saw before. <sighs> to be for someone else what God was for me, it reminds me of what he did for me in the first place. Being a part of someone else's conversion brings our own conversion back to life. It's amazing. It rekindles those flames. It helps us feel more, even though we can't say the least part of what we feel. And yet, what is Mormon, excuse me, what is Alma feeling about this feeling? This is the irony. Verse 3 always surprises me because out of such a beautiful outburst in 1 and 2, oh, that I were an angel. I just want to bless the world. I want to eradicate sorrow that comes from sin. And then speaking of sin, he thinks he's guilty of one. Verse 3, he says, behold, I am a man. I do sin in my wish, for I ought to be content with the things which the Lord hath allotted unto me. And I sit back there going, are you kidding me, Alma? You're sinning in that wish? Well, I'm not going to give you my wish list then. Because if that's an unworthy petition, all you're asking for is to, this is more used would I be. Is that wrong of me to ask for? This is John the Beloved. This is the three Nephites. This is, make me an instrument of thy peace. How could that possibly be sinful? Well, wrestle with that. And what I love is what he said at the end. I ought to be content with what the Lord allotted me. I don't think the sin was what he was hoping for. The sin was wishing that he could trump God's will with his own. Because God has given me this time and to serve in this way. This is my part of the vineyard. This is the portion that I'll play. And I guess I should be accepting of that content with that, grateful for that, that I got to play a part at all. I was talking with an amazing student recently that was struggling over some of her own struggles and wishing her life were different and wondering why God made her the way she is when it made it difficult for her to be all that she thought God wanted her to be. And we talked about this passage. And it was beautiful to be able to reassure her what you're asking for is not sinful at all. But can there be a measure of contentment in the situation that you find yourself in? And just accepting that, trusting God enough to trust his will and to be grateful for it. For the rest of this chapter, it's a short one, but Alma is going to wrestle with that. How can I come away content instead of wishing I could do more? One of them is uh, a realization that he makes in verse 4. He says, I ought not to harrow up in my desires the firm decree of a just God, for I know that he granteth unto men according to their desire, whether it be unto death or unto life. And that verse always confuses me because it's like, wait a minute, you just said, I know God gives us our desires, and you just expressed your desire. So shouldn't you just be expressing in faith like, hey, I'm ready for angel 101. Change me anytime. I know you give us according to our will. Hmm, no, that's not what he's saying, because he knows his will is not correct in this one. I need to submit to the will of God. So what is this verse saying? I think he's saying, oh, I get it. I want to eradicate evil. I want to eliminate sorrow by eliminating sin, but that would eliminate agency. And I'm amazed at how much God is willing to suffer himself, this God who weeps, because he really does honor the choices that we make. He will, he will sit there and allow us to choose death even when he was offering us life with all the hope that he has. No wonder he weeps. No wonder he sorrows, but no wonder he allows us to choose. Know this, that every soul is free to choose his life and what he'll be. 
For this eternal truth is given, that God will force no man to heaven. This is a realization that even Alma has to make. I can't force people into the mighty change of heart. I have to lead and persuade and coax and convert, but it has to be their choice. Fellow parents, that's a realization we're going to have to embrace as well, as hard as it might be. And then this other. The last one I'll share is verse 8. One more piece of personal reassurance on Alma's part. For behold, the Lord doth grant unto all nations of their own nation and tongue to teach his word, yea, in wisdom, all that he seeth fit that they should have. In each of these verses, Alma is trying to talk himself out of his uncontented wish. And it's not just, I want to eliminate sin. The first part was, it's the sin I want to get rid of. Oh, but that would eliminate agency. The other part that he's doing now is the I part. I want to eliminate sin. I want to, oh, that I were an angel. And how does he correct himself? Oh, there are angels aplenty. I don't have to be the only one. Thank heaven for all that Ammon and Aaron and Omner and Himni did. Thank heaven for Amulek and Zeezrom once he changed and my sons that came with me on the mission. I'm surrounded by a multitude of angels and they are singing praises. They are changing hearts. They are eliminating sin and sorrow. I guess I can spread the wealth. It doesn't have to be me alone. I am grateful to be part of that same cloud of witnesses. I'm grateful that you are part of that as well. I'm grateful we all get to be angels in our own sphere of influence. And I pray that we will preach and teach and testify with the same level of devotion as the people we have studied these past two weeks in the glorious missionary chapters in the Book of Mormon. To give you our quick list of phrases to keep savoring, here it is for this week. There's a lot. I'll, I'll have to be selective. Free access, no obstruction. Never did fall away. Lay down the weapons of their rebellion. Taken away the guilt from our hearts. The merits of his son, all that we could do washed bright through the blood of the sun. He loveth our souls as well as he loveth our children. Oh, how merciful is our God. A testimony that we have never used them. Bury them up deep. The Lord worketh in many ways to the salvation of his people. Once enlightened, serve to strengthen their faith in Christ. Retain a hope through faith. Verified his word in every particular. How great reason have we to, re have we to rejoice? Can ye tell? Instruments in the hands of God. Gathered into the garners. The storm cannot penetrate to them. In the hands of the Lord of the harvest. Let us sing to his praise. I know that I am nothing. Brought to sing redeeming love. The matchless bounty of his love. Who can glory too much in the Lord? I cannot say the smallest part which I feel. When our hearts were depressed, the Lord comforted us. This is my life and my light, my joy and my salvation. As though they were angels sent from God. We will try the hearts of our brethren. Joy which none receiveth, save it be the truly penitent and humble seeker of happiness. Their hope and views of Christ. Sorrows, afflictions, and incomprehensible joy. Reception and safety. 
the great talk call of diligence. Oh, that I were an angel, not be more sorrow. Content with the things which the Lord hath allotted, all that he seeth fit that they should have. This is my glory, this is my joy. What the Lord has done for me. May we ponder the things that God has done for us. May we reflect on the things he's allowed us to do for him. And may we see that those were gifts to us all along. I am grateful for him. I am grateful for Jesus. I cannot say the least of what I feel about him, but what I feel I do try to share. And pray you'll do likewise that we can come together and rejoice in a God worth rejoicing in. Thanks so much for listening to Unshaken, a proud member of the Faith Matters Podcast Network. You can learn more about Faith Matters and check out our other shows at faithmatters.org.